Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now for those of you that saw our interview with Adam Wilkins last time out, you will know that he has sold Complete Kit Car, but it's all for the good. Jack Wood, who has been working for the magazine for the last few years, is taking over and I'm really pleased to say we've got Jack here to tell us what's going on with the magazine and tell us how he got to this position. Welcome Jack. Hi, no, thanks for having me guys. Uh We've really been looking forward to this. Sorry, I've had to put you off, but it's been a busy few weeks. So I we can imagine because taking over a business is probably not a small step, is it? No, especially someone that's been salaried all his life. I've, I can barely remember GCSE business studies, but I don't think it's put me in good stead for this. So we'll see. Well, funny you mentioned back in the back your school days. Let's let's rewind a little bit. How how have you got to sort of the point where? you were in the position to take over CKC? Well, I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit, but really I've always wanted to do stuff with cars. So back when I was about eight years old, there was a game that came out for the original PlayStation called Gran Turismo. I'd never really been interested in cars before then. I was just really just into video games and just messing around and stuff like that. And the thing that was cool about Gran Turismo was is it gave you... Um, a budget of 10,000 credits to go out, buy a car and tune it up. And then you'd, you'd complete the game. You'd have like a whole collection of cars. But what was weird about it, because it was a Japanese game, is a lot of the cars were what we know now as JDM, Japanese domestic market products. And it was, I got really into the weird stuff like the Suzuki Cappuccino. I mean, we did get the Cappuccino over here, but cars like that. And it sort of became an obsession. And that obsession sort of, Got me into British cars, classic cars. TVR were always a big part of the Gran Turismo games. And I sort of fell in love with British fiberglass and stuff like that. And then it was only a short, short step. So the TVR started out as a kit car manufacturer, so did Lotus. And yeah, yep. but yeah, so I sort of really got into to kit cars and then and just cars in general. And I was like, I want to do something with cars. And I'd have loved to have become an engineer. In fact, that's where I was sort of pushed. But I never really had... I was always sort of a pretty pretty good at like English and history, but I was never amazing at maths and physics. But for some reason, the school sort of pushed me and I did a mechanical engineering degree that I did okay at, but I sort of, okay. I left university and I was thinking, I'm not going to get the JCB or the Land Rover sort of work that you want to get at the end of that. And I was sort of thinking, do I want to do this? or do I want to do something else. Um, so I became a lab technician for a year just to sort of work out what okay. I wanted to do with my life. And then I, I came into a little bit of money, like in, enough to take six months off of work. And I'd, I'd, I'd always read magazines, car magazines, car blogs. And I set my own one up and looking back, it wasn't particularly good. But when the position came up for complete uh, to, to work for, for performance publishing on Complete Kit Car and the then new Absolute Lotus magazine, I just applied for it. And then Adam sort of looked at the blog and I think he saw that yeah, it's, it's this this guy sort of knows what he's on about, and he's you know this someone I can sort of mold into whatever that, that could work with the magazine. And then a few months passed. I didn't think I got it. But I sent an email back to him to say, oh, just just out of interest, sort of why not me, sort of thing. And it just got to the point where I'd actually not hired anyone yet. And then he asked if I wanted to come to a track day at Castle Coombe. Um, and then, yeah, he basically said, do you want to do it? And at the time, I was living in Manchester, which was a two and a half hour drive from the Grantham offices. Uh, but I still just made it work. Like, it didn't really work financially. It probably have been better at that point just to stay blogging. But I just, I just had to do it. It's actually quite funny when he was on about, oh, he owned a Midas. And, and yeah. you mentioned, oh, coming to the office of Midas. I actually tried to do that. It made it 10 miles out of Manchester before the RAC I had to move it on a low load. And I actually came down. I had a 1992 Mercedes Coupe. I don't know how I afforded that car at the time, but I did. And that's actually the car I showed up in. But yeah, as readers probably know, the Midas has always sort of been around, but not really around because it's never really worked properly. But, but yeah, that's not how I got into it. But if you were, you know, how, how kit car is that to break down on the way to the interview? But what better than to come up with a, a classic Mercedes to roll up with it anyway? Yeah. So you, 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 better than any CV that you could have put on the desk. Yes, yeah, and uh, I mean to be fair, I was surprised the Mercedes made it. I, I, it very, it came very close to being my mum's Fiat Panda, I think. Um, but yeah, no, we made it in the Mercedes. But yeah, it was, it was a good interview. 
and yeah, it was yeah, that's five 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 and a half years ago or five years ago, and yeah, been at CKC and Absolute Lotus ever since. So, so talk us through your role on the CKC side of what you've done at the magazine while you've been there up to now. Well, Adam's always been really really good. Where it's like he's always been the editor and he's always run the company, but I've always felt like I've had input. And I think it was a probably a year and a half, two years ago, we sort of gave the magazine like a, a, a little sort of facelift. And we sort of came up, a, a lot of the, some of the new ideas came from me and I sort of did, I don't know if people who read the magazine, but we have like a bit, it's not actually called classic news in the magazine, but we had like a section to do with sort of classic kit cars and stuff like that. And I, I sort of, I, and that's something I want to do going forward as well, is not just to be a industry completely focused like the industry is always going to be the biggest part of the magazine but I, I sort of want to give the classic kit cars that I'm also interested in a bit of a push too because I feel they get short shrift from like um, the mainstream classic car magazines you know if it's not a proper production car it's not worth going in but there's so many interesting classic kit cars and contrary to popular belief they're not all terrible so um, but yeah so I've, I've, I've always sort of had control of the features I've done and I've always had a lot of input. So it's magazine content wise, it's not massively different. I've just got the fun bits of distribution, emails from the printers, stuff like that. But yeah, it's, I've, I've always had like a hand, you know, my hand's always been there sort of thing with CKC for the past four years, at least really. Okay. So you're, you're sort of moving along with CKC. You're coming up with all these new ideas. It's all going extremely well. You're in a nice salary job. <laughs> and then what changed? <laughs> How did it all come about? Oh, oh what the purchase, purchase, purchase yeah. company the car. Um, well, yeah. So if, if, since COVID, with me, the way you sort of it's worked for with me and Adam at least is I've been working from home most of the time. But then I'd I'd come in to do proofing and just a few other bits. We'd have like a regular meeting to make sure everything's sort of try and get a plan together. Um. But then I got a phone call uh, on one of my work from home weeks to say, I need you to come in on Monday. And as soon as he, just after he said that, he went, it's not bad news, but I can't tell you what it is over the phone, which my brain instantly goes, okay, this is bad news. What's what's coming my way sort of thing. And it was, a, yeah, it was pretty difficult to sleep on the Saturday and the Sunday. And then I was driving down to Grantham on the Monday and I was going through my head, like what conversation was going to come up? I had no idea what conversation was going to come up. And then he sort of came out with it saying, I, you know, I, I want to focus on Absolute Lotus magazine. I still want to be a part of CKC, but I'd, I'd sort of like to move on so each magazine has its own focus, which is something it, both magazines have needed. Um, uh, so we sort of said, would you like to take it on? Um, I had about a month to decide. Well, I said I wanted a month to decide, and he, he's pretty easy going, so he was okay with that. And I left the office mostly thinking, hmm, do I really want to pay for my old job? And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a lot of work to set up as you know set up my own publishing company basically uh but by the time i'd got back to sheffield i was sort of thinking i don't think there's anything else i'd rather do at least at least right now and yeah and like adam said in the previous video like i, I love absolute lotus i love i love most classic cars and i, I and cars as a subject so there's barely anything i find more interesting but yeah ckc has always been the magazine i've, I've liked the most I, I just love the variety either from history or even now if you just if you just look at the industry if you go from ultima to beach buggies you know like kingfisher customs to and even even though to the like outsiders there's a lot of seven esque roasters you know cars that like the cage from seven and stuff like that but even they have their own you know differences and they're all their own car and i i just love that so if you look through so that's the other thing if, would i move to another magazine but if you go to any sort of classic car sort of standard publication and you look at their back issues for the past two or three years, you're going to see three or four Jaguar E-types. You're going to see quite a few Mark I Escorts, RS200s, whatever, like that sort of thing. And Complete Kit Car is such a unique magazine in the fact that, you know, we every issue is just completely different, whether it, it might be a, a three-wheeler that someone's made themselves, like a special out of bits, or a super focused track car, and I just I just love that. So, and you've got a, the other thing I would imagine, and you touched on it with talking about classic kit cars. You've got such a fantastic back catalogue, which you know we can come on to talk about sort of the industry as 
as it is today. But you go the back catalogue, the number of manufacturers that have been over the years and cars, good and bad, that have come over the years. You've got such a, a, a an area you could, or different areas you could focus on. You've got sort of material that could keep, keep you going for, for decades. Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's, there's no danger. And there's, there's some good stuff in the pipeline. I know that. Um, I mean, in fact, um, if we include the issues, I mean, this, the the, the uh, October issues out now, and then November of issues, my first issue. But actually, if we go all the way up to December, we'll have a brand new kit car model in each one of those magazines, which is just crazy. Like, it's it's just insane how productive these these manufacturers we have are now, and that's before you even get into the classics. And yeah, admittedly, there's some funny, there's, there's some classics that where their merit is just how odd they are and sort of how did that get onto the road but the majority are they're all interesting and the majority are quite good or maybe not the majority but like yeah well actually i would say the majority yeah they're interesting and it's it's also amazing how many people like the gordon murrays and the pete stevens have dipped their toe into the kit car industry because they wanted to do something fun that they wanted to do and that's what i like about the manufacturers we have you don't get a sense they're doing it for purely business reasons because there's way easier ways of making money with the sort of engineering knowledge they know they have. They do it because they want to do it more than anything. Well, that's how, that's sort of what I take from it. So, but and the other thing, just to take back a step, uh, and I think I touched on it with, with Adam, is you had a fairly manic um, deadline schedule going on <laughs> when you were all working on. Absolute Lotus, complete kit car, and alternative cars, which we mentioned uh, in the last video, has been has been sort of parked for a, a few months. It must have been absolutely crazy, and it must have taken pressure off both of you that you know on Adam's side is Absolute Lotus, your side it's CKC, and you've only got twelve or thirteen issues a year for yourself to to worry about. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm still get like Adam's still going to be doing some stuff for complete kit car, like quite a bit of stuff because I'd be stupid to not use him um but um i'll stop doing stuff with the legs mags but yes it's 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 good to yeah I, i'm purely focused on ckc and whatever extra stuff i do is extra stuff because yeah it, it was getting to the point where it became and there'll always be an element of this because we have the british weather and time to put up with and photo shoots are often difficult when your main subject matters are classic lotuses and kit cars in the sense that will the car make it to the day but it became too much of what is possible as opposed to what we want to do and it's going to be quite good for both magazines to have what do we want to do and what is possible as opposed to just what is possible um but i don't, I don't think we ever put out a bad issue but there was a few moments where deadlines were getting incredibly tight and it was just a lot of stress for everybody and we annoyed her you know people like the printers and designers and stuff were well not, maybe not annoyed but yeah it was we we're pushing everyone's deadlines on and it was just not a fun situation to be in office side. It's always a fun, photo shoots are always fun, but the office side wasn't much fun for the past year. I don't, I wouldn't say so. And and the other thing is if, if you're taking that pressure off yourself to an extent, that'll allow you presumably to be more creative and have more time to come up with the articles that you want to do. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, is um, we, me and Adam always had plans and of, of stuff we wanted to do anyway. So it'd be quite good to revisit those lists because they still exist. They're still on our computers. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'd like to do. I'd like to do more fun stuff. I think, I think for the time being, the magazine's going to look. There's there's a few changes in the next issue, but it's nothing major. I think it's sort of keep the keep the issues coming out. But I think next year, the, yeah, I'd like to do some big things, or well, at least a big thing, and then lots of fun things that are fun for me and also the reader. And so we're talking sort of evolution rather than revolution. Yeah, I don't. I, I, yeah, I don't. I don't. I mean, the magazine has a. A core fan base and there's people that have stuck with us and in fact if you go through the subscriber list quite a lot of readers have been around since yeah you know since since the magazine started sort of thing like there's, there's a lot of people that have never lapsed the subscription and yeah I, and also if you go back to the old witch kits and stuff which i've got a whole bloody unit full of now and ckcs and stuff there's it's the dna of the old mags is still there and i don't want to lose that but having had them around and and stuff like that, we'll, we'll keep that too, sort of thing. And also, I learned from Adam, Adam learned from Ian, and um, yeah, and so forth. So, Peter Phil, and they obviously Peter Philby as well, and then Ian learned from Peter. So, yeah, I don't think it's it's never going to be unrecognizable, but I just like to get, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like I'd like a few big features at least a year, sort of thing. Put, put your own stamp on it. 
Yeah, well, yeah, or I just even it's, even if you go back to some of the older issues, like I I I, I don't want to promise this, but I'd love to go back to when we have an in-house build, you know, an in-house kit car project, and the the old road trips we used they used to do and stuff like that. I'd love to bring that back, but then yeah, I, I would like to put my own stamp on it too. But it's just more just just going yeah, just a few more of the epic features um, as well, sort of thing. And and just to reassure all the readers. Um, that despite the fact there's a, a, a new name on the uh, the front page of the magazine, everything else stays absolutely the same. Subscribers, it'll all carry on as it has done, and you'll be in oh. the same shops and digital mem- um, subscriptions, all that. Everything stays the same. Every, yeah, everything stays the same. I mean, the team are exactly the same. It's just one of the members is now freelance is, instead of being editor. And, but yeah, the whole t- I'd, I'd be stupid to change that, and I, I wouldn't want to change that. So I, yeah, we, we all have a good working relationship, and um, yeah, it's yeah, every, everything is is a okay and pretty similar. It's just a hopefully, well, no, the magazine will get just more of a focus going forwards. So that brings us right up to the modern day. Let's do a little bit of a rewind. Tell us, you know, some of the stories and some of your thoughts of your time so far at CKC. So maybe some of the interesting uh, cars that you've seen. And maybe then we can sort of go on to your thoughts on the industry as it is at the moment. Well, I, like I was saying before, like I, I, I love the, how like varied the industry is. I, th- I think I think recently it was like a week where in the same week I went to see an Ultima RS. I went to see the new Kingfisher Customs buggy, um, and I went to see a new free wheel. Like I, I, I love that. But and they've all been on their own merit, but. Um, I think the I think the industry is in a really exciting place. Even though people keep coming up, oh, it's not as big as it used to be and stuff like that. But like all the products are genuinely good on their own merit. And there's some there's some interesting stuff going out of there. And just speaking about my time, I remember the first time I went to uh, to see Stuart Much and Sylvia at um, at Mev, and it was just to go and just do like a, what we used to call talking shop. Where I used to do an interview with a manufacturer. Um, and I got around there and I saw in the corner of the workshop, there was a Mazda RX-8 just, just sitting there. And I sort of went, oh, what's, the, what's that all about? And he sort of started to get like that and stuff like that. And then eventually he sort of said, well, this, this sort of goes nowhere. But we're sort of um and ahhing about developing an RX-8 version of the Exocet. And obviously that car came out last year. And that was really fun to see, sort of just see, to see that actually, yeah, they went out and did it, you know, so. There's always the danger of saying, oh, I'm going to do this thing that it just gets pushed by the wayside. But I think everyone in the industry is so proactive that there's no real danger of that in, in the kit car scene. And yeah, it was quite cool to see that because that, that was a cover car not so long ago. So it's finally I, out, sort of thing. Yeah. But I think that the way the industry is, is, is what suits the market because I think there's two or one major factor is people like, oh, you know, kits are so expensive. Well, you know, things do go up over time, but the customer expectation has changed tremendously from the days of the likes of, of Dutton or Robin Hood, you know, putting out hundreds of kits in, in, in a weekend. People are expecting a lot more quality nowadays. And I think the phrase that gets used quite a lot is people expect them to, to click together like a Tamiya kit rather than back in the day where... I always remember I had a, a Dutton once and I was speaking to one of the Dutton owners and they said, the thing you've got to remember about Duttons is you build them. The cars like Westfields and cage rooms, you assemble them. And, and I think we've moved away from the build element very much to the assemble. And that's what customers are expecting. And I think the industry's had to lift its level to suit that. No, exactly. I no, I, I Yeah, there's, um, there's not a kit car that I can think of particularly that I wouldn't dare go out and build myself sort of thing but if you look back to the older older kit cars where they only had to go through an mot and you'd have to you know change the logbook i i don't think i'd i dare touch one of those really and it's actually it's, it's quite sad but sometimes when i was in the office at grantham we'd get a phone call and someone would say well i've got this um jaguar e-type replica but i've tried to take it in for an mot uh, but apparently it's registered as a jaguar xj6 and then you go into the whole well you've actually made a big error there sort of thing and mention the IVN and go, oh, will that be difficult? And it's like, for one of those kits, yes, absolutely, that will be very difficult. Um, but yeah, no, like to, like the kits that are around today, I mean, 
I'd, I'd probably say 50% of the people I meet for the builds are first time builders, no previous mechanical knowledge. And I won't say it was easy for them, but it wasn't that steep learning curve. And they completed the car within a year and two years around work commitments and family and stuff like that. It's They're not impossible to build now. You don't need to be a trained mechanic to build a modern day kit car. And the manufacturers offer so much more support than some of the previous ones where you would just get a box of bits and you'd have to find a Ford Cortina and then also bits from another car. And yeah, there's, there's, there's very little of that now, which is, I think is a consumer, a good thing. And yeah, you have to pay a bit more for that, but the car you're driving on the road is safe to drive on the road. And yeah, you're not yeah. going to, yeah, you've, you've not spliced a, a wiring loom and all that sort of stuff together. There are parts, everything's ready and everything will assemble as it should. Um, you don't have probably- much thinking to do. Yeah. And I think one of the things we can thank for this, and it does get a little criticism, is the IVA SVA test, which filtered out possibly, um, choose me words carefully, maybe some of the manufacturers that were at the lower echelons of, of maybe quality and so on. But I, I think that's been a big trigger to raise the whole level of the industry and, and help get it to where it is today. Oh, no, I think the IVA is, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're putting an American V8 or a Honda VTEC K20 engine into a car, I, personally, as a motorist and also someone that would drive this car, I'd, I'd like to know that it meets a minimum safety standard. And the other thing about the IVA, which is quite funny, is everyone, the first time someone builds a kit car, they all say how terrified they are that, you know, they've read the manual 20 times before even ordering a kit. But then actually, once they've come around to it, even if they fail the first time, for a lot of people, it's a positive experience because they don't want you to fail. They'll explain why you failed. They'll give you a snag list and they'll explain how to do something better. And a lot of times people will walk away and go, actually, I understand why you said that. I understand why they've said that. It's sort of, yeah, that's, that's, that's something that I, yeah, I've, I've learned from this experience. It's not, it's not as negative an experience as people first think it might be. And, also, with the way the, the quality of the kits and, and the models that are out there now, do you think we're moving to a place where the mainstream sort of shows and media are starting to realise kit cars aren't what they were sort of 20, 25 years ago? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are definitely seeing some of that. And we are seeing kit cars in other publications. Like I remember when Autocar did the um, the LB um, Strats replica and stuff like that. I think, yeah, I think we're getting there, but this, the stigma's still there because I, I really hate it when you pick up an issue of Top Gear or Evo and they'll say about some specialist car that's just come out and they go, it's got an interior like a kit car, which I just, I just, I just hate that because actually nowadays, you know, I mean, that's up to you, but I mean, a lot of builders, they, they don't skimp on these builds. They will, you know, use the best wood, leather, whatever sort of thing. It's, yeah, they're not just speedos that are falling out and just really crap fake Alcantara anymore. But the stigma's still there. So we are getting more respect, but I think kit car is still a dirty word to some people. And I do hate it when people build a kit car, but they're not proud of the fact and they'll, they'll say something like, oh, it's not really a kit car though, is it? Meaning, oh, it's a cut above a kit car. But no, the kit car literally means car built from a kit. You know, it's not, it's not a, a standard sort of thing. It is literally a process. I don't know if any other magazines have, you know, any other sort of magazine um, sub- subject has a similar issue. Like, you know, is Lego is Lego an assembly block or is, is Mega Blocks not? I don't know, but yeah, oh. it's, it, I find it odd. I find it odd that kit car is still a dirty word with some people, and the stuff's so good now. And it was interesting when I um, had a chat with um, guy who I've known, Steve Holt. I won't, you know, I just threw the question up in, up, up into the air and a, a, a bit like um, a feather that he blew it straight out of the sky. I said, well, do we need to change the name of the industry? Is it like component cars or something like that? And he was very much, no, it's kit cars. Yeah. We've just got to let everyone else catch up and understand where the market is. And it's not where it was 20, 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, kit car is the obvious name for it. It's a car from a kit, but the, but like it goes. It, I mean, we had a little chat before, and um, basically, like, it's it's so funny how people that are really into their cars, you know, I always said like an encyclopedia when it comes to cars. How kit cars are a massive blind spot. Like, I've been to to parties where mutual friends have sort of said, "Oh, yeah, Jack's really into his cars. He works for a magazine." Um, to do with cars and we'll have a chat and anything more obscure than a Delta HF into Grali 
goes right over their heads. But it's, it's rarely a bad conversation. You sort of show, I mean, if you're trying to get someone into cars, it pays to start with something like um, an Ultima or something like that. But then when you go into it, people are amazed. They go, oh, wow, and all this. And oh, and people build these themselves. And then it's actually usually a positive conversation. But it's, it's sort of amazing how many people don't know we exist to say, you know, we've existed for so long and so many, so many big manufacturers that you can still buy cars from today started here. So, and the, but the only thing I, I feel, and, and it is a difficult because I understand the research and development area of it, is the, the industry at the moment is so reliant on the replica market, whether it be of the two mainstream or the three mainstreams, Cobras, GT40, and the, the seven market. And also uh, and the 356. Sorry? Also the 356. Oh, yeah, of course, the 356, the Chesil Space, I mustn't must forget that, uh, and other replicas uh, of a similar nature. Um, apart from things like, off the top of my head, the Exocet, there, oh, and the, obviously the DJC um, car. Um, there's there's so little individuality out there now compared to what there was 20, 25 years ago. And I realise it's probably an easier sell for a you know to sell somebody a Cobra replica factory built for you know sixty grand compared to an original Cobra, which you, you, is astronomical money, but that's a reasonable buy. It's getting people to buy into something that's a little bit different. I think that's quite a difficult sell, but I'd love to see more stuff um, like that that's a bit unique. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, like, I, like, I mean, honestly speaking, like, yeah, no, I, I, I love all the original designs. There's been some, I mean, out of, like, out of all, if I could own any sort of modern classic kit, I'd probably be a Dax Kamal or something like that. Oh, yeah. But... I I think I, I understand like what Adam was saying last time. I understand I understand why we do the replicas because I mean the main thing is it's it's selling a dream and these cars are unobtainable by other means. And also I've, we've met people who've had genuine AC Cobras, Shelby Cobras, and stuff, and they just don't drive them. So this is and then they build you know they build a quality Cobra and actually they're a lot better to drive you know because it's it's the power of engineering hindsight. You know we you know they're, they're not the same you know. 100% accurate sort of thing, but in a good way. Um, but I, I sort of feel like the original design sort of fell by the wayside a bit when stuff like the Mazda MX-5 and the Nissan 350Z and secondhand cars just became so capable and so cheap. But I'm sort of hoping the way the secondhand car market's going now, where just any of those sort of cars are actually unobtainable in a condition that you'd like to use one, that we might see a return of more original sort of kit cars. I don't think we'll ever get back to the sort of kit car that does everything, you know, like in the 80s where you had genuinely practical ones that could replace your family car. And also, I don't think we'd actually want that. I think I'd, I'd like them always to be occasional cars, but it would be cool to see a return of more original designs. And I think, I think, yeah, I think as a second car, second-hand car market goes a bit crazier and as these modern classics become more difficult to restore, that there's the potential there for someone to jump back in. And you've triggered the thought in my mind, which goes back to the Westfield Chesil factory tour that we did, is that the modern buyer of you know kit cars or turnkey or in kit form want their cars to drive like modern cars. And you mentioned about people, you know, with original AC Cobras and stuff like that. You know, they drove like 1950s cars. And it's particularly with the what they what Chesil are doing with the West with with the speed stuff is putting underpinnings under it that aren't a beetle because people want to hop into it and expect it to drive like a an MX five or or something like that. They want um, you know disc brakes. They want you know uh, rack and pinion steering. They want double wishbone suspension. Uh, so it drives like they expect it to, even though it's wrapped up into a classic package. And maybe this is the, the great thing that might sort of open the doors uh, more to the mainstream car area for us. I think it definitely will. I think one thing the kit car industry doesn't get enough credit for, but like to the rest of the sort of automotive sphere, resto modding is a new, exciting thing. But we've sort of done that for years. We've sort of taken old designs, but just pushed the tech up, pushed the engineering up, you know, because the end of the day for most people the reason they love these cars is is the visuals and the performance so why not boost the performance and keep the keep the visuals the same sort of thing but you see like the singapore and stuff and magazines right like it's a completely new idea but 
when you look at the, the Gardner Douglas sort of Cobra replicas and stuff, and you know they've had backbone chassis and all sorts for years. It's, it's to us, it's not not a new thing. It's still exciting, but it's not new. Mm. I don't think we get enough credit for that, really. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Well, Jack, that's been absolutely fantastic. I think you know it's brought everybody up to speed about where you've come from and obviously your enthusiasm and passion for the industry and how you've ended up with the the magazine on your plate um (laughs) you mentioned about maybe one or two new things coming up in the future you've got in your mind you talked about you know having an in-house build anything sort of new and exciting you can just give us a little bit of an inside line to that you might be dropping in the magazine soon well we we have hinted quite heavily that we'd like to uh, i mean you've seen the cycle carts that's a, that's that, that's a new thing I want. <laughs> yeah. I want the magazine to to sort of get behind. Like obviously we're primarily a kit car magazine, and we always will be. But like we've always had room for specials, and I, yeah, just driving those cars and the interest that the feature I did on that has sort of generated um, makes me think it's not, maybe not quite low cost level, but it sort of seems like that might be one of the next big things in car building home you know building cars from home sort of thing you know i think would be stupid not to get involved with it and there's so much fun that i'd love to get involved with that anyway so yes hopefully that will come up soon and watch this space because <laughs> yeah we might be involved this end as well which is why i pulled a little face there so uh, um jack, jack, <laughs> jack, jack sort of dragged me in there with that one so you know we've got uh, maybe something that we can uh, release between us hopefully in the near future on that one so um that will come to you soon jack it's been an absolute pleasure i hope you've enjoyed it as well yeah no no it's, it's, it, yeah it was, it's good to get get this out there sort of thing i uh i was a bit nervous and i'm sure people could tell i'm not used to the camera but yeah no, I, I have enjoyed it but i am also looking forward to uh <laughs> putting away and you'll be seeing people at all the, the shows in the future as uh, the same as you've done in the past so i'm guessing you will you be at auto sport in january yeah, we'll also we'll be uh, well, well, we'll definitely be at the NEC Classic um, oh, cool. in November. I don't know about Lotus, but possibly um, and possibly Race Retro as well. Um, but yeah, you'll definitely see me around, and um, yeah, and hopefully we'll get out to some more shares next year. Who knows? But it's a bit too early days at the minute. But yeah, we'll definitely be the NEC yeah. Classic. Yeah, you, you've been moving lots of magazines and uh, sorting out everything else, so yeah, you'll get around to the shows when you can. Yeah, <laughs> can't wait to move the stock again. But yeah, no, it's going to be good. Brilliant. So thanks to Jack for uh, taking time out to talk to us like he has and giving us a full update of where he is with CKC. And hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, this video for 7 Spot. And if you have, please do us a big favour and click that subscribe button. It makes so much difference to, to us here. Until next time, take care. <laughs>